Hashem Sefatai Tiftach Ufi Agiti Latecha. This is for uh, my daughter Shuli. The problem with laughter is really simple. There are no subtitles. When we laugh, it's because we're surprised by something. So I laugh. But you don't know, because there are no subtitles, whether I'm making fun of you or celebrating you. And, and the subtitles thing, it works in two ways, because I might make a joke, and it's such a well-intentioned joke. I meant so well. Thank you for understanding. But I don't have your subtitle. I don't know that you just came from a funeral or just got bad news or found out that 17th text you sent your ex-boyfriend wasn't appreciated. <laughs> so it's really, really dangerous. And the truth is, is that laughter can be so dangerous. It's like playing with fire. The truth is, my favorite quote about it is by Rabbi Weinberg, who says, laughter destroys everything in its path, good or bad. It's so powerful. It's so dangerous. It can destroy the most sacred moment, but it can also just ease all the tension, right? So in fact, think about it. The first time we ever have laughter in the Torah, in the Bible, um, one person laughs, Avraham laughs, and it's super awesome. And then his wife, Sarah, laughs a little bit later, and that's super not awesome. And so we find out that even in the Torah, subtitles are confusing, and maybe laughter is not so, so good. Um, for me, it got really personal and really important, professionally and spiritually, emotionally, lots of lees. Um, a while ago, about 25 years ago, I was sitting at my kitchen table in my parents' house next to my bubby, my grandma, and a bunch of us were sitting around. I had just gotten engaged to a rabbi. <laughs> and uh, I was making a joke, which shouldn't so su surprise you at this point. And uh, everyone laughed, and then my bubby leaned forward and she said, Rachel, you're gonna have to stop that because rabbis' wives don't make jokes. <laughs> so I waited a moment or two because I'm respectful. I said something, it must have been incredibly brilliant. Um, everyone laughed and we moved on, but my Bubby's wise words really shook me up because she's brilliant, my Bubby, and she's making a really important point. And she's saying to me, Rachel, you want to be taken seriously as a Jewish leader. You're a Torah teacher. You want people to come to you if they have a problem. You want to be taken seriously when you write your amazing book that's a bestseller about Hashem and Torah and God, and it's awesome. You can't joke. You don't just want to be taken seriously. You want to be someone people can trust. You can't go joking. So maybe she's right, and maybe I had to pick a team. And so I was really battling with this. On the one hand, my bubby is so right. She is. And on the other hand, I love laughing. I love being joyful. What do I do with that? So I love learning Torah. I think I mentioned that to you. So I decided to go about this Talmud style and have an, you know, an internal debate. So I'm going to share it with you with the volume on. Here we go. So <laughs> Team Bubby. So Team Bubby is over here. So Team Bubby, I, I did some research. I, I crystallized it down to some of my favorite sources for Team Bubby. Here we go. Team Bubby's first source comes from Asechet Brachot, where we're told we're not really supposed to fill our lives with laughter in this world. Think of it like this. We don't get the joke yet. We're still in the joke. It's too early to laugh. <laughs> Second source for Bubby, and this is you know, kind of poignant for all of us, how many of us on Yom Kippur are not sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, I said that wrong thing. I, I, I hurt that person. I was hurt by that person. In fact, so, many, so much of the text of Yom Kippur, when we say al chait for different things, are actually involving making fun of something or someone. Really painful stuff. But the most compelling source for Team Bubby is this. Avraham and Sarah, as I mentioned, were the first people that laughed in the Torah. When they laugh in the Torah, there's a backstory. And the backstory is this. Before Avraham and Sarah were laughing, Avraham had a son with someone else. He had Yishmael with Hagar. Fast forward about 14 years later, and they're having a big party. They finally have their own baby. Fantastic. At the party, Yishmael, Avraham's first son, was doing what I imagine most older siblings do at younger siblings' birthday parties. They were metzachik. He was laughing. OK, Sarah sees this. Uh-uh, not in my house. And she goes to Avraham, and she says, that boy and his mother are out. And shockingly, that seems to be enough to convince Avraham that Yishmael and Hagar should leave. 
So maybe my Bubby's right. And maybe there really is no room for laughter in the house of Avraham. It's tough, guys. Team Bubby has three points. <laughs> but I am her granddaughter, and she loves me best. No offense to my brothers out there. <laughs> so let's try Team Rachel. So Team Rachel has some interesting ideas. Rebbe Akiva is one of my heroes from the Torah. And there is a very sad and beautiful story about Rebbe Akiva when he and some of his friends were very brave and they went to go see the destruction, the remains of the second temple. And it's a really powerful, very, very sad story. And they see that the, literally the temple is destroyed. And in the Holy of Holies, in the Kodesh Kodashim, there are foxes running around and, and they, the, the tears can't be stopped. And they, they rip their clothing in mourning and they're sobbing. And Akiva laughs. And they look at him and they say, Akiva, really? <laughs> And he says, guys, do you remember when the prophet predicted that the, the temple would be destroyed and that foxes would walk in the Holy of Holies? And we thought, no way. And it happened. He says, don't you understand? Those same prophets predicted that we'll come back and rebuild. And if that no way happened, then this no way can happen too. And they said, you're right. Akiva Nihamtani, you comforted us. Amazing. His laughter gave them hope. My second source for Team Rachel is pretty famous. Laughter is the best. Thank you. But you're not the first people to say that, nor am I. King Shlomo said it a number of times in the book of Mishlei, Proverbs. He says that when we're visiting the sick, we're trying to cheer them up, we should laugh. And if we don't laugh, no offense, we could atrophy their bones. It's a schnasty image, but nevertheless compelling. But my favorite source for Team Rachel goes like this. In the book of Devarim, in Parsha Kitavo, we find out a list of really scary curses that might befall us if we don't perform the, perform the mitzvot correctly. What's really fascinating is the reason given for why we might suffer through all of these curses. And it says, not that we didn't perform any mitzvot, the reason that we might have these terrible curses come upon us is because we did the mitzvot, but we didn't do these mitzvot, we didn't perform them with joy, gladness of heart, with laughter. That means it's not just enough to do the mitzvot. It's not just enough to even do them with love. We have to do them with joy. We have to do them with laughter. So now we have a big problem. Team Bubby has three and Team Rachel has three and they both have compelling points. Team Bubby points out laughter is dangerous. It's like playing with fire. You've got to be careful. Team Rachel points out it's a prerequisite to being a good Jew to be able to laugh. What do you do? Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Rav Shnir Zalman of Liadi, the Baal Hatanya says that actually studying kosher laughter versus unkosher laughter is an intellectual skill that we must Nurture. He quotes Rabbah, one of the rabbis from the Talmud, who used to start his classes with a joke. He says that we actually have to engage in this intellectual activity. So let's engage. Let's go back to the first case of laughter in the Torah. Remember, there's no subtitles. In fact, in the Torah, there's not even little dots. It's really, I, I remember the day my son figured that out. He was really disappointed. Okay. So Avraham finds out from Hashem that he's going to have a baby. And his reaction is, Vayitzchak. He laughs. Now, there's no subtitles, remember, so the only way we can find out what's really going on is by God's response. And God's like, yeah, like liking it on Facebook or hearting it, I guess you could say. A little bit later in the story, Sarah happens to, I don't know, by accident over here. The angel's talking to Avraham about this thing about her getting pregnant at the age of 90. And by the way, she was barren. And she laughs because it's funny. Now, there's no subtitles there but God is not pleased with her laughter. And she and Avraham and Hashem get into this whole thing. You laugh. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. It's very, it's like a whole weird, like middle school thing going on there. And, and then we find out like the parenthesis, like we find out like her thought bubble is there. And she says, um, she says, everyone who here will laugh. It's not clear if they're going to laugh at her or laugh for her. And Sarah's laughter is the key. And here's what I mean. Avraham's laughter was celebratory, was joyous. Wow, I can't believe that's how this story is going to end. That's so great. Thanks, Hashem. Sarah's laughter was disbelief. It's a kind of cynicism. Uh-uh. No way. Cynicism is when we protect ourselves by pretending, like it says in Kohelet, 
in Chadash Tachar Hashemesh. There's nothing new under the sun. I know everything. I'm going to protect myself. I'm going to become insular. I'm going to be deliciously, intellectually cynical because it protects me from being hurt. And I don't blame Sarah. To be honest with you, she had a tough life. She must have had to give up hope a long time ago. But when we protect ourselves, we do something really dangerous. And what we're doing is we're not letting God in. If letting God in means being open to being surprised, and if we laugh when we show surprise, then if I'm not willing to laugh with joy, I'm, I am going to be laughing out of cynicism. Sarah's laughter is a rejection of God's power in her life. Abraham's laughter is a joyous acceptance of God's power in his life. And now we find out that they're the two opposite extremes. So how are we going to figure it out? And it's the coolest story because I know you want to hear. It has to do with juggling fire. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> One of my favorite stories in the Mishnah goes like this. On Sukkot, it was the most amazing party. And people from all over the world would come to see this party. It wasn't just any party. In fact, the Mishnah says, if you've never been to this party, then clearly you've never partied. Don't be jealous. I wasn't there yet either. But I'm, <laughs> I'm really psyched to go someday. This is what would happen. All of the rabbis would be not just our dancers, they would entertain us. In fact, the Mishnah describes that the rabbis used to, I kid you not, juggle fire. Let's contemplate this for a minute. Now, I am not yet um, coordinated enough to juggle, period. But I imagine that juggling fire requires a lot of practice. That means that these Torah giants, these great leaders of the Jewish community, took time out from their learning sacred time to practice juggling fire. And for me, that is the perfect analogy for what we need to do. We need to start thinking about laughter as something that we need to teach and practice doing right. The same way we read body language, we teach public speaking, we teach our kids to say please and thank you, we notice the people around us, we need to cultivate and teach laughter as part of our avodat Hashem, our service of God. So let's think about how do we do that? So there's a great book called The Laughing Classroom. And in The Laughing Classroom, they actually talk about four kinds of laughter. And one thing they suggest is that we first try sort of to self-diagnose. The most essential piece I want to mention to you is that there's one kind of laughter that's all bad, one kind of laughter that's all good, and two sort of in the middle. Let's start with the yucky one. Someone who's a life mocker, that's that cynical laughter. That's that really obnoxious person who makes that line, and there's a winner and a loser that you know, leaves. Here's the catch. When we talk about laughter, we don't only mean knock-knock jokes or slapstick humor or satirical great lines or a wonderful story. We're talking about just being open to being surprised and delighting in this surprise. This means that our conversations at our Shabbat table, our sermons, our business meetings, the conversations we have on a date, ladies and gentlemen, the conversations we have in our heads with ourselves have to make sure that none of that conversation allows for mockery. The next level of laughter is a joke maker or even a fun meister. Those are, those are the great lines. There's a great joke, a great line, a great story. And most of the time, they're really fantastic, but we do have a negative possibility. And we have to be careful not just that my intention is good, but that the audience hearing my joke is receiving it in the, in the same way it's intended. But the highest level is something that they call the joy meister. And when you have experienced laughter that comes from joy, you feel humanized, you feel authentically alive, you feel great. You've probably experienced it once in a while. It's an elevating experience. It's an amazing thing. So what do we do? We practice. So I decided that with my friends, I needed to be called on it if I ever crossed the line. Because sometimes you just need a code word. I asked my friends to call me on it using this word, Yitzchak, and here's why. The child that Abraham and Sarah have, his name is Yitzchak. God himself names that child. And his name makes so much sense. Let's think about this. He wasn't supposed to exist. His dad is 100. His mom is 90. Did I mention she was barren? He defies all logic. You know, Mark Twain has this great quote where he says, you know, Greek civilization was amazing and then it, it died out. And Roman civilization was so powerful and it died out. And he asked sincerely, what is the secret to the Jews being around? And he doesn't know. I'll tell you, surprise, that's the answer, surprise. <laughs> the answer, thank you, the, the, the answer is 
that we are, the Jewish people represent that Hashem doesn't work by, by you already know how it's gonna go, nothing new is under the sun. Hashem works by surprise. Hashem works by laughter. If laughter represents being surprised, the more we open ourselves up to laughter, the more we open ourselves up to God. It's an amazing thing that being Jewish and laughing in, laughing in a holy way actually welcomes God into our lives. So let's think about this. How do we do that? Masechet Sanhedrin describes what God does all day. Can you imagine getting a look into God's to-do list? <laughs> Can you imagine? I'm, I'm like overwhelmed just thinking about it. Um, but it says that every day God sets aside one hour to practice laughing and being joyous. So if I could go back in time and I could continue that conversation with my Bubby, may she rest in peace, here's what I think I'd like to tell her. Bubby, you're right. Rabbis' wives don't make jokes unless they practice. <laughs>